Now, are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. We got a lot of topics to get into today. We do. We do. There's there's a lot today because, you know, between starting the show with the recruiting news and then the fact that, you know, we had all this other stuff, this was a very newsworthy type day. So fill in the blank. Notre Dame promoting Max Bulla from graduate assistant to full-time linebackers coach is blank. It is the perfect fit. Uh, he was a GA for Bama back when they won a national championship. This past season was his first season as a GA under Al Golden. Um, and then as a result of this, obviously, we you, you know, this is to help Mike Mickens and, and you know, his um, kind of uh, the, the, the responsibilities that he gained along the way. Um, and I think that, you know, Bull is a guy that's young and determined and he's um, – He's a good fit for the situation. He grew up a Notre Dame fan. Um, he has family members who, you know, went to Notre Dame or might have been Notre Dame fans. I can't entirely remember. So, like, he has he has the passion for it. Uh, he's a younger guy, and he was a really good, you know, linebacker. I, I think he fits what Al Golden is trying to teach in his system. And he's the kind of guy, because he's been on the job for a year here at Notre Dame, and – the head coach coached linebackers, right? And the head coach was a defensive coordinator before he became the head coach. And you've got a really sharp defensive coordinator on the job as well. Like, they know what they've got in this guy. If anyone can spot it, it's Marcus Freeman and Al Golden. And so the fact that, that uh, you know, a lot of these guys, a lot of these GAs, you know, just kind of end up being GAs for a long time and it's like oh is he ever going to get you know a, a, an actual coaching position what's going to take that kind of thing and so I think the fact that they were there every day they saw Max Bulla and I think the proof is in the pudding as well like when you look at the job that Max Bulla did working with Notre Dame's linebackers last year like Maris Leofau is in a much different spot right now than he was a year ago at this time Leofau was a major question last year now He's got an invite to the NFL Combine, and he's got a chance to to be in an NFL linebacker. Ditto with J.D. Bertrand, and you know Jack Kaiser improved in his one year as well. So there's there's a lot of upside, I think, and they're getting a young, hungry guy coming in to be a part of this Notre Dame defensive staff. You know, like a full time, actual part of this defensive staff. So I think it's nothing but a good thing for them. So the other move that is now official, you know, that we saw in the release today about Max Bulla is Mike Mickens has gone from just being cornerbacks coach to defensive backs coach. This, of course, after the departure of Chris O'Leary going to the Los Angeles Chargers. Scale of 1 to 10, how much do you like this move of Mickens coaching the entire secondary? Yeah, this is another big win for me in a 10 out of 10 uh, solely because he, he's just continuously shown uh, that he deserves more on his plate, you know, especially after the success with a lot of these young DBs, Benjamin Morrison getting, you know, all American honors as a freshman, the talent of, you know, uh, Christian Gray and Jaden Mickey and, and their ability to get on the field um, as young defensive backs. And, you know, it's only a matter of time before he gets into more and more of a defensive coordinator type role and so you kind of have to keep feeding him to kind of quench that hunger as he prepares to become a defensive coordinator and inevitably, you know, along the way. And so if you're Notre Dame, you have to harness him and use his knowledge and his ability as long as you possibly can. And so giving him this promotion just allows him to stay at Notre Dame longer, because if they're not going to give him the promotion, others people, other people certainly will. Tommy with the 9.8 out of 10. I don't know what happened to that other two tenths, but Tommy is uh, almost all in. I'll go 10 out of 10. I I love it. You know, there's there's a case that Mike Mickens of all the position coach, you know, you like if you were doing position coach rankings, which we probably actually will in the very near future do a position coach rankings. I, I think Mike Mickens is going to be, if he's not at the top, he's at least in your top two or three, depending on, you know, what you're going to look at. So the fact that you're making him the coach of the entire secondary, I just think it makes sense. I think it's, he's, he's the perfect fit. And then all the reasons that you talked about, this is a guy who 
with each year is going to be more in demand. So you give him more responsibilities. He was already the passing game coordinator. And it just, you know, I, I think that there are some people, you know, maybe who at least initially were concerned. Oh, you, you know, you're putting too much on his plate. Can he actually handle, you know, safeties and cornerbacks? If you can coach, if you can coach cornerbacks, cornerbacks, I think that you can coach safeties as well. And the guy is really sharp. And I think that the fact that you've got him more involved in the recruiting at that position is only going to help as well. So I think it's a, a really good move for Notre Dame now. And you look at the staff that they've got. It's it's a really it's a really good staff going forward now. I mean, it already was, but just even more so now. It feels like it's just getting better and better. Yep. Every year. Every as like Marcus Freeman gets his guys, you know, they get like in place. I think it's getting better all the time. So three years ago, Jack Swarbrick said Notre Dame would not participate in the upcoming EA Sports College football game. Today, Swarbrick issued this statement, quote, after nearly two years of work with EA Sports, we're proud to announce that our fans around the world will be able to play as the Fighting Irish in the upcoming college football franchise. The work that EA Sports is doing to provide over 11,000 college student athletes opportunities to benefit directly from their name, image, and likeness is a first-of-a-kind undertaking, and we're proud to have been involved in the process, end quote. So it's official, Jess. What do you think? Notre Dame is in on the EA Sports college football game. Yeah, obviously, I love it. And I actually never knew that not being in the game was on the table until I read this question that you sent me earlier today. Like I never knew that Schwarbrick initially came out and said that Notre Dame wasn't going to participate in the EA sports. Well, I, he said until, until they got this, this, the NIL part of it, mm. you know, figured out basically he was, he was drawing a line in the sand and saying, Notre Dame is not going to participate unless our student athletes are compensated for being part of it. That, you know, that was, that was the original, original line that he drew. So that was going to lead me to my next question of why, you know, the stance changed. Um, right. But it's very clear that it changed because he wanted it to benefit his student athletes. And I, I mean, I think that was going to be the case regardless with the relaunch of the EA sports and the current landscape of the NIL. I don't think you'd be able to release a game, you know, showcasing these different players and their talents and being able to play with them and, you know, all the different dynasty modes. And there's so many different things you can do, you know, on those games. And so having Notre Dame a part of it, I think is like having a big piece of college football, right? Like when you think of college football, you think of, you know, Notre Dame is one of those top 10 programs in no particular order that you would think of in terms of like college football history up there with, you know, USC, Alabama, Ohio State, you know, you, you start thinking of them. And so to not have them a part of the game, I think would have been, a big letdown to the college football community. So it's really good to see that they're going to be a part of it. It's amazing to me, like how big a topic this becomes. Like, do you, you know, I know you, you played video games and stuff like that growing up. You had, you know, like the NFL and you even had, I think the college sports game there for a while when they had it before, you know, they, they got rid of it. You had the basketball and the football. Do you, are, you're not like in actively into any of this gaming right now, are you? No, um, but I, I will so. say that college football was my favorite game to play growing up. That and like Call of Duty. I think Vince and I kind of talked about this last week. Um, okay. I just remember being able to like, you know, play online with my friends. And, you know, basically we play against each other as mm -hmm. different teams. And it was always always super fun. And uh, I would be lying if I, if I haven't considered how I'm going to potentially play it once it releases. So, Oh, so you're saying you're, you're, you're working your way back in now that they're bringing it back. Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. I, I think it's important that Notre Dame was involved in this and they released that the little trailer last week EA Sports did, and it was pretty obvious before Jack Swarbrick released this statement that Notre Dame was going to be involved because they had like the players coming down the steps, the Notre Dame players hitting the play like a champion today sign, and there was like a a crowd shot where the, you know with the band and Notre Dame fans and stuff like that. And from what from what I understand, there's an article I think in the Athletic today, and you know there's there's some quotes in there 
uh, from Aaron Horvath, who who works with Jack Swarbrick and you know part of the administration over there at Notre Dame, talking about how many different things Notre Dame provided to EA Sports to make sure they got the exact right flavor of it, and that's exactly what this is all about. You know, again, like one making sure that if you're representing players out there on the field that the players who are being represented are being compensated for being part of it. That's that's why these college games went away to begin with, the Ed O'Bannon lawsuit back in the day. And I remember when you were young, when we would go up there and we would play the college basketball, I remember like, you know, playing Ed O'Bannon in UCLA, you know, those teams from the 90s and Tyus Edney and and all those, like, that's why this whole thing came about, because it was obvious who was being represented in these games, but they weren't being compensated for being in these games, even though they were represented in it. So that's, you know, again, it goes back to to why the line in the sand was drawn by Jack Swarbrick, making sure that they were going to be compensated for it. So I like it, and I just, I don't think that you could have had a real college football video game like do we call them video games like what are they even like is there a technical name for wow, it? like it's video games still. this video game I, I just i don't think you could have one without notre dame being involved in it so i'm glad that they were able to get all this figured out long-winded way of saying it. so on the actual college football field the college football playoff board of managers unanimously today voted to include the five highest ranked conference champions plus the next seven highest ranked teams in this season's new 12 team college football playoff field. It is called the five, seven model as opposed to the six, six model that was originally proposed before the PAC 12 went poof. Bye-bye. So do you like this change going to five plus seven as opposed to six plus six? Yeah. So when I first thought about it, I was pretty indifferent on the change but then I realized that the change does benefit Notre Dame yes. because <laughs> now instead of being a potential, you know, the best potential seed that they can get is a six. The best potential seed that they can get is a five. And well, so they still could have they still could have been a five seed. It's just that the top four. Well, we'll get into all that. They still could have been a five seed before. But what it does is it opens up an extra at large bid, basically, that Notre Dame can get. Right. It allows them kind of more wiggle room because they can't get that automatic bid um, for the conference championship. And so I I do think that that benefits Notre Dame. And for that reason, I I have to support the change. That model of five, seven is going to be more beneficial for for Notre Dame compared to the six and six. And so for that reason, I got to say that I like it. Yes, I do as well. And of course, you know, there's already you know, because everyone always fully understands everything. Sports business reporter Joe Pampliano tweeted this today. The new college football playoff will put the four highest ranked conference champions as seeds one through four. That means that even if Notre Dame is the number one ranked team in the country, they would get the number five team, requiring them to win four straight games to win a title. That's brutal. It's also a horrible take because this is something that has been known for years, regardless of if it was the five plus seven or the six plus six. Jack Swarbrick was in on the meetings with this. He and Greg Sankey and the others who were part of this committee that came up with with, with the 12 team format. Jack Swarbrick was in on the negotiations and the creation of this format. This, you know. If it was six plus six, the best Notre Dame could do was going to be a five seed. Now that it's five plus seven, the best that Notre Dame can be is a five seed. Again, we've talked about this a lot on this show. All this means is Notre Dame is an independent. All these other teams are going to have to play a conference championship game. Notre Dame, obviously, being an independent, would not have to play in a conference championship game. So Notre Dame is essentially giving up the, uh, the the right to have a buy because the only teams that can get a buy, those top four uh, seeds, are going to have to play in a conference championship game and win that conference championship game to get one of those top four seeds. Notre Dame is saying, well, we're not in a conference, so we can't be one of those. 
but that's also an extra game that they don't have to play. They, they don't have to play in a conference championship game. So again, like outside world wants to, you know, wants Notre Dame to be in a conference and they look at it as, you know, some big detriment to, to Notre Dame and everybody else. The fact that they don't have to be, you know, that they're not going to get this by, it does not work against Notre Dame. When you do the math, you're either playing the 13th game by playing in a conference championship game, or you get to be Notre Dame. You're not going to have to play in that 13th game, but you also give up the right to be one of those top four. Yeah, I mean, Notre Dame's 13th game would be that first, you know, first, first round, round of, round of playoffs. Yep. While everyone else, at home, potentially. At, you know, all the conference champions would be off because they already played that 13th game. And then, like you said, it's also going to be advantageous to Notre Dame because it's going to be at home. And then would if, if they were five or six, they would be potentially playing, you know, one of the worst remaining teams um, available in that first round. So, you know, for Notre Dame not being in a conference, this is set up very nicely for them. But it's funny how a chain reaction happens because of someone like our good friend Joe making a misinformed tweet. You know, I'm now getting friends texting me because of it saying Notre Dame needs to join the conference. The best they can do is this, this and this. And it's like. You guys, you would think I know about this stuff already because this is, you know, <laughs> I'm a fan. I know what the repercussions are and, you know, what the general proceedings are uh, of Notre Dame's right. you know, potential playoff the, fixture. The only benefit to, to being in a conference is, okay, you can end up being a top four seed. But again, you're just substituting one game for the other. Any team that is in a conference – to lock up one of those top four seeds, you have to be one of the four highest rated conference champions to get one of those top four seeds. So that, again, it means you have to play in a conference championship game. Notre Dame does not have to play in the conference championship game. So the best that they can do is a five seed that, you know, you're, you're just giving up one game for the other. And like you said, instead of playing that 13th game, in a conference championship game, Notre Dame's 13th game would be the first round of the college football playoff. So they essentially get a bye week, and then they would start the playoffs the next week. Or, you know, not the next week, but a couple weeks later when everybody else starts the playoffs. But they also don't have to play in the conference championship game. And remember, the team that loses the conference championship game, in it, you know, there, there's going to be teams that lose in the conference championship games, they still have to play that conference championship game. And then by losing that game, that's ultimately going to affect their seating. You know, like where where they play, they still have to play that game. And then they play their 14th game in the playoffs. You know, so, and, and you know, again, their seating can be affected. They They might go from potentially being a home team in the playoffs to a road team. Someone could get, you know, booted out. And the other thing that this does, the five plus seven, you know, again, it the seven is the seven at-large teams that creates one more at-large opportunity for Notre Dame. So that's good for them. But it also, if it was six plus six, then you were going to have two group of five teams in the playoff. Going to the five plus seven, that means you're only going to have one group of five, most likely one group of five because the five is the five highest rated conference champions. And now you're not going to have a pack 12. So that takes you from power five to power four. Da, 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 da. So again, it's, it's all good for Notre Dame. It's not bad for Notre Dame. Yeah. I think it works what out. People would have you say, you know, think works out well in the end uh, and us MA 87 also brings up a good point. You know, they'll have extra time to rest, you know, time to get healthy, time to prepare. Yeah. So if you don't have to you don't have to play a conference championship and then get ready for a playoff game at the end of the regular season, your season is done. And then you will yeah. have extra time again to to be off and, and start your preparation. Yeah, again, it's one less game. It's it's it comes out in the wash for the teams that make, you know, the the conference championship games it's it 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 comes out in the wash there and it's just one less game that notre dame has to worry about playing and winning or losing and mr 2.0 says that a home game in december as the five seed versus the 12 seed 
probably better than a conference title game. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And now that is that is still assuming, you know, like if Notre Dame runs the table and they were the number one or number two team in the country, the best they could be is the five seed. But again, they don't have to play that and they are going to play a lower ranked team as a result and get a home game out of it. So you're absolutely right in that instance. Okay, so Salty gave us a super chat earlier. <laughs> Thank you, Salty, for the super chat. He wanted to know if I have any strongly held opinions about Notre Dame women's basketball. If so, please express them directly and explicitly. My kids are not in the room. So uh, that's a reference to uh, last week, last Friday. When Vince and I were here, so fill in the blank, Jesse. Notre Dame women's basketball winning at Duke Monday night is blank. Uh, winning at Duke Monday night is much needed. And the reason why I say it's much needed and not to be dramatic is, you know, Notre Dame is kind of is slowly finding itself in that not middle of the pack range for, you know, the ACC right now, but they're, they're not a top four. They, they're hanging around kind of in that five or six spot. Um, but, you know, Notre Dame needed to stay in the hunt in terms of the ACC regular season and to also get some advantageous seating by the time, you know, the ACC tournament comes around. They also needed to stay in the hunt for a potential top 16 bid, because if you're a top 16 bid, that means you're one of the four teams in each region that is going to host, you know, potentially host a couple games in the first couple of rounds. Um, and it adds a solid road victory to their resume for all of those things. And it allows Notre Dame ultimately to stay in control of its own destiny. They, they have Virginia tech coming up. They have Louisville coming up. Those are big games with teams ahead of them currently in the ACC right now. So while it doesn't seem big, you know, Duke is a solid team playing at Duke is never easy um, as well. And so it's, it's still a, a big road win in my, in my opinion, and it keeps them on track for their kind of bigger goals to end the season here. Duke had not lost at home since December 3rd when they lost to South Carolina, who's obviously the number one team in the country. That was their last home loss. It's only their third home loss of the season. Duke was also allowing 57 points a game in ACC play, just the fourth time that they've allowed 70 or more points in a conference game. Uh, and the sixth time overall this season. They allowed 82 in an overtime loss to Stanford, 77 in that loss to South Carolina as well. So not many people, not many teams get to 70 against Duke. But, you know, let's just ride the roller coaster now. Are they good now? Does this make them good again because they beat Duke on the road? You know, be, you know, can Neil Ivey coach now? You know, because those are the, you know, the answers to the questions, you know, that that seem to ride on the results of, of every game, you know, everyone just, this is basketball. There are a lot of games and everyone seems to overreact to every game that they play now this season. It was a good win. They're still in contention to get a top four seed, like you talked about in the ACC tournament and still, you know, in that running to get in that top 16, which would mean, you know, that, that they could host NCAA tournament games. Now they're probably going to have to win out to get that. And it's not going to be easy because of those games you mentioned against Virginia tech and against Louisville, but they are home games. They do have a chance. They're tied for six in the conference right now. The bottom line to me is the ACC is deep. They're probably going to get the, – the conference is going to get at least eight teams in the NCAA tournament. Virginia Tech's in first place. Their losses are to Florida State and Duke. Those are their only two losses in conference play, Virginia Tech. And guess who's beaten both of those teams? On the road for both of them. Yeah, on the road in both of them. That's absolutely right. Great point. You know, NC State beat Notre Dame last week. One of their losses is to Miami, another team that Notre Dame has beaten. So to me, it all just like the ACC tournament is going to be crazy is what it comes down to. Like it's going to be, I would not be surprised if, you know, if, if if a team that is seated in that six, seven, eight ends up winning the whole thing when it's all said and done. Because like when you look at all the head to heads, it's just been nuts so far this year. And it's a again, good quality win for Notre Dame. And I'm not gonna go much farther than that. So Yeah, and I, I just think, you know, I, I wasn't a part of Friday's show. I was I was traveling actually to to come see you guys and 
You know, I, I think that Notre Dame, first of all, like you mentioned, the ACC is incredibly deep this season. And I think an underappreciated thing about what Neil Ivey has done this season with Notre Dame is imagine losing on paper your three most significant players all at the beginning of the season. You know, when you consider Olivia Miles, Sonia Citron, um, and then Prosper as well, can and Prosper, you're losing three players that you thought were going to be in your starting lineup, and now you're introducing a freshman to be to run the team. You know, again, something that you probably didn't plan for at all. And now as these players are becoming healthier, you're integrating, you know, these these important players back into a team that's led by a freshman. And so what does that balance look like for Sonia Citron coming back after a team has been run by Hannah Hidalgo for majority of the season? And how do you allow those things to match? After she missed two and a half months, right. Right, allowing after she missed two and a half months. And so, you know, while people want to criticize Neil, I would say that Neil could almost be praised for allowing the ship to stay steady, still beating teams like UConn throughout the season, still holding strong in the ACC, despite having a multitude of injuries and finding a way to allow a true freshman to run your team and integrate healthy players as they become available. Jesse, you know, you're just making excuses. That's all. It's just <laughs> making excuses. <laughs> Again, I don't know what was spoke about on Friday, but that's just my opinion on this situation. Many, many of the things that you just said were just, were were said. But thanks for listening to the show. <laughs> uh, Tommy Guns, Tommy Guns uh, wants to remind you there is no C A. Yeah, I'll never Jack get Silver over it. I'll always you're going to be Schwarbrick. Can you say Bavakwa? Bavakwa. There you go. You're not going to have to worry about it. Well, anymore. and it's, yeah, I just think I'm so used to Kyle Schwarber. So I just want to say mm -hmm. Jack mm -hmm. Schwarbrick, you know? Yep. DK, no excuses. Rule number 76, play like a champion. Bro. Man, I miss DK opening up the pocketbooks on Friday, I guess. I want a, I want a $50 bomb here and there. <laughs> Jess, you'll be glad to know that our buddy Brent is here. Oh. And... We're about to, excuse me, get into a question that's going to make Brent pretty happy, especially depending on what your answer happens to be. So over the last 30, excuse me, I got the hiccups a little bit here. Over the last 30 years, three decades, this stretches back before you were even born. Quarterbacks who get to the Super Bowl for the first time and lose that game have never gotten back to the Super Bowl again. This list includes Stan Humphreys, Neil O'Donnell, Drew Bledsoe. Now, um, O'Donnell and Bledsoe were actually backups for other teams, but they never got back to the Super Bowl and played again. So I just want to clarify that before I go through this list some more. Chris Chandler, Steve McNair, Kerry Collins, Rich Gannon, Jake DeLome, Donovan McNabb, Matt Hasselbeck, Rex Grossman, Colin Kaepernick, Cam Newton, Matt Ryan. Those guys are all retired. Here are the five active quarterbacks who are on this, who are fit the billing, fit the bill. They got to the Super Bowl as starters and lost their first games. Jared Goff, Jimmy Garoppolo, Joe Burrow, Jalen Hurts, and Brent's very own Brock Purdy. <laughs> Rank those five in the order you think has the best chance to get back to another Super Bowl. Again, last 30 years. Quarterbacks who have gotten to the Super Bowl and lost their first start in the Super Bowl have never gotten back to another Super Bowl as a starter. So rank those five that I mentioned, Goff, Garoppolo, Burrow, Hurts, Purdy, in the order you think could actually get back to another Super Bowl. Yeah, so I found the bottom two to be very easy and the top three to be very hard. And so I will start with number five, and that's the person who is least likely so Jimmy Garoppolo, I think we can all agree on Jimmy Garoppolo at the bottom. Completely agree. Got him in my five spot as well. Um, number four, uh, this one again was easy for me, might be difficult for others. I'm going to have to go with Jalen Hurts. I feel like he has, and this is not, this is not, you know, cowboy bias -y coming out. This is, this is logical thinking cap on. I think Jalen Hurts has, he, he, he was very fortunate to play with a very good offensive line very good offensive weapons. And he came into a team that was 
under good organizational control. There was a lot of things working for Jalen Hurts and, and, and benefiting Jalen Hurts. And I think this season, when you when you saw Jalen Hurts needed to step up a little bit more, he naturally couldn't. I think he, there's a limit on his natural ability. So I'm just going to leave it at that for number no, four. I mean, I agree. And there was – I can't remember who it was. Someone was just basically saying that, you know, they don't – they're not buying on Jalen Hurts either, that he's not that great a quarterback. And if you put Kyler Murray out there – in Philadelphia, you might be thinking a lot different about Kyler Murray compared to him playing in Arizona. Right. And so, I, so I agree. Jimmy G is five Hertz is also my number four. So this is where it gets really tough because <laughs> I think that there are, so we're left with Burrow, Purdy and golf. And I think one guy is more talented. I think other guys have a better situation of, you know what's around them, and mm -hmm. so how do you how do you equate that? Um, I think two guys have the better team. One guy is clearly the best quarterback. Burrow right. is clearly the best quarterback. Yes. He's obviously you know had injury. You know no what, offensive like, line. Like to me, you know, especially like when you look at the AFC, it it like the odds tend to work against Joe Burrow. Like was that just a you know one time? run because they've already fallen off a bit yes you know even you know even you know him him notwithstanding just as a team and I mean that's the nature of the NFL like the the Bengals have fallen off a little bit what is the realistic chance of them getting back again so that leads me to number three Joe Burrow um so I you've think, got Burrow at number three huh yeah I, I okay. because you have to consider Patrick Mahomes is also in the AFC for Joe Burrow and he's and, and Purdy and, and golf for the NFC. So I think naturally that path is going to be a little bit easier. Um, Burrow doesn't have a good offensive line. Uh, he's had the injury bug. I think they're going to have a problem at wide receiver. You know, didn't have a good line change. when they went to the Super Bowl though, either, you know, just to be fair. That's true. That's true. Um, but that I, I have, I have Burrow at three. And then I have Purdy at number two, and then I have Goff at number one. And I think I'm solid with Purdy being number two, but I, I could be convinced if you want to flip-flop Goff and Burrow at one and three. I could be convinced. Um, I think Purdy I, – I almost want to say the 49ers have peaked a little bit. I think Kyle Shanahan has peaked a little bit, and I don't know – how much they can continue just to get back, right? Like it takes – they talk about the the fatigue of, of, you know, going to the Super Bowl, winning the Super Bowl. I still think there's the fatigue of kind of continuously falling short if you're the 49ers. And I, I just think that the, the the Lions and why I have Goff number one, I just think he's got – you know, the Lions did a great thing this season, and I still think that they have untapped potential, and I still think they can get even better. They have a great offensive line. Their defense is getting better, and I like their their uh, offensive weapons mainly. They have really good running backs and wide receivers. So that's where I leave it. What is your one through three? So, like? so yours is Goff and then Purdy. Purdy and then Burrow. Yep. And then Hertz and then Jimmy G. Yep. Tommy was getting all bent out of shape. I was saving Tommy's answer because of the way that he answered. Hertz, Joe, Jimmy G, the other guy, then Purdy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so he has one, two, three, four actual names on this list. And then the other guy is in his number four <laughs> spot. So that's why I was saving yours, Tommy. Um yeah, Brian, Ryan apparently left and then came back in. Yes, we are still going. We are still going right now. Good to have Ryan back. Um, Brent, Brent, is Brent serious when he's saying golf over Purdy? Or like what? <laughs> is this in response to something like he's ticked off at you? I've got golf number one on my list because yeah. it's the NFC and – you know, one, Goff is on a different team now than he made that first Super Bowl with. Right. And, you know, he made that first Super Bowl with the Rams. And then, of course, they made that trade. The Rams got back to the Super Bowl with, of course, Matt Stafford, and they won that Super Bowl. You know, so that's like an interesting dynamic. You know, so Goff being on another team, that team is better. They're going to, I think, you know, they're, they're you know, one of the youngest rosters, I believe, in the NFL right now and they were you know sniffing you know getting in there 
you know, to the Super Bowl with Goff to begin with this year. So they were knocking on the door, barely missed. I I go back and I, I went back and forth on Purdy and Burrow. I put Burrow at number two just because he's the better quarterback. But More all talented. the things but all the things that we talked about, like would seem to be like it push him farther away from it. But then again, you know, like he's got Lamar Jackson in that division. Look at what the Browns did with Joe Flacco right. this year. You the know, Steelers like the Steelers are always 500. They're tough. So I think I, to me, because of the, like, because of the coach, you know, Cal Shanahan, regardless of the knocks he took in the Super Bowl, like the system that he's got, the roster that he's got, and everything else. How long they're able to keep that together is going to be right. the biggest question. And that's where I kind of talked about them peaking a little bit. like Right. Exactly. Like, was this year their peak, and how long are they going to be able to keep all those guys together? Because that definitely helps Brock Purdy. You know, I know that Brent doesn't want to hear it, but, you know, game manager, system quarterback, and the whole thing, <laughs> you know, this, it all comes into play. And so, like, that's that's the question to me is – how much can Joe Burrow's talent bridge kind of the defense, the deficiencies on the rest of, of the, the rest roster? of the roster? Yeah. How far can that take him? Because I mean, it took him to a Super Bowl before, but he had to stay healthy the entire time. And he really hasn't been able to right. do that since. And that's the thing for Joe Burrow. Like, is he going to have to sort of wait out Patrick Mahomes career and see how long Mahomes stays around? I mean, look Look at the quarterbacks. You've got Patrick Mahomes. You've got Josh Allen. You've got Lamar Jackson. Who else am I missing in the AFC? You know, it's you know, obviously you've got Mahomes. If I didn't mention him, or you know, Justin even, Herbert. Yeah, Justin Herbert and and Jim Harbaugh is coming on now. That's going to change the dynamic there in the AFC. So I mean, C.J. Stroud looks good. I know it was only one season, but yep. Okay, let me clarify. A lot of people are giving me a lot of flack right now for the Steelers are always 500. They're always 500 or better. They're not always 500. They're always – like a bad season for the Steelers always feels like 500. Like they're always cranking out a winning season or better. So I just wanted to clarify. That. Steelers aren't always 500. I think they've won a few – well, yeah, with – but. They're not going to win any Super Bowls with the quarterback that they've got right now. You know, <laughs> you know like that's why I've heard sorry. Russell Wilson. I've heard Justin Fields to the Steelers. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're trying to figure it out at quarterback. But again, give, they're give always five hundred better. They've got a good coach, but with what they've got, they don't have Ben Roethlisberger in his prime anymore. You know, they won those Super Bowls because they had Roethlisberger, the most recent ones, because they had Roethlisberger in his prime. I'm trying to figure out. ND Saylor, is he being serious about this? He said that's a meaningless stat. The sample size is too small. <laughs> like three decades, 30 years is a <laughs> that's that's a pretty big. I think he's joking, but I'm not exactly sure about that. <laughs> oh I'm not putting Dallas in that conversation. Like I know Dallas is bad. Like <laughs> Sorry, you can't. I, I've never picked Dallas to go to the Super Bowl. So, do I want them to go to the Super Bowl? Yeah, but like, if that's the best comeback that you've got. Um, so I saw a tweet the other day. Here's what it said You know, speaking of your teams and performances, if you could send a message to your 10 year old self to emotionally prepare yourself. For your upcoming life as a sports fan, what would the message say? Um, I had to think about this one, but I and you know me, I get I get tongue twisted in words, so I had to be it had to be short and concise. And this is what I came up with: prepare yourself for failure in the big moments, but enjoy the memories you make along the way. And, and the reason I say that is that it feels like every big moment that the Cowboys are in, whether it was the botched Romo, you know, extra point or field goal hold, whether it was getting beaten by the 49ers every year in the playoffs, whether it was this or that, the Cowboys are always, you know, 
falling short in the big moments. And then you flip it to to the to Notre Dame. They fell short in the national championship to Alabama. They have fallen short in all of the New Year's Six Bowl games. But the memories I made along the way of being able to go to the national championship game, being able to, you know, uh, enjoy some of these moments along the way, it's still been nice. You know, it, that's the reason that you are a fan because you endure the painful moments. But like I said, I would I would most tell myself to be prepared to be let down in the biggest moments. Yes, I think that's the key. Be prepared to be let down. DK says, don't follow Notre Dame from 1994 to 2023. I mean, that's that's my mine is kind of like um stop watching sports about you know <laughs> after you turn 25. I think I mean that's pretty much it. You know, like when it comes to the, you know, like all of the Cowboys Super Bowls obviously were before you were born and uh you know you're 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 creeping closer to 30 as you reminded me the other day which just makes me feel older you know like it, at least i've got a couple of you know kansas has got a couple national championships but if i look at, at it specific to the royals football, snuck one in there yeah the royals got one in like i never thought that that was coming and that's what gives me hope you know whether it's whether it's cockeyed optimism or or what, you know, between Notre Dame and the Cowboys, like I never, the Royals would have been the last team that I would have ever thought would even go to a World Series, let alone go to two in a row, be within, you know, two, you know, two runs, you know, get to game seven of, you know, in 2014 in that first World Series and then get back and win it again the next year. I would have never thought small market team, who they are, the whole thing, they never would have had a chance. So I, I think that the Royals, not just getting to the World Series, but winning that World Series has basically got to give sports fans everywhere, you know, just completely unrealistic hopes that their team can actually get in, whether it's Notre Dame, Cowboys, you know, whether it's baseball, football, whatever sport it happens to be. But, my, you know, the message to myself would be just give up all hope right now. And then <laughs> <laughs> that would have been that would have been it. Just give up all hope. Be thankful for what you've got right now, because you're you're in for a long ride in the long run. But that's that's, you know. Yeah, that's exactly right, Chief Brody. It is hard to watch sports <laughs> when all your teams suck. It absolutely is. Brent says he was born in August 76. Okay, so now we're going through everyone's birthdays. Paul was 72. <laughs> DK was Everyone's telling 25. us how old they are. That's right. All you fools right. are almost to 50 or just got past 50. Tommy was 88. Brody. Young pup like Jesse, 96. Nice. We share the same birth year. Yep. Good year. In the last year, the Cowboys won a Super Bowl. That was in, you know, what would that have been? I guess it was still January of 96 when they won it. And then uh, Jess was, Jess's birthday is uh, less than a month away at this point. Yep. Let the countdown to 28 begin. There you go. All right. Well, appreciate you joining us tonight. We did go for a while tonight, by the way. It's almost 7.30, but uh, we wa re -wa rocked, we rolled. Thanks to Ryan for all the recruiting news at the, at the top. If you came in late, Jesse uh, bestowed us with a little whiteboard earlier. So there's some good whiteboard stuff. Mike Denbrock, Riley Leonard, and that offense, and, and uh, Ryan and I. Talked a little recruiting with the Matty Augustine commitment earlier today as well. Some uh, some big stuff there. All right, Jess, appreciate you as always. Vince and I will be back. Manya, actually, did I have any comments that I want? Oh, yeah. Brent wanted to know, would the Cowboys like Debo Samuel? I Love believe it. the answer to that would be yes. Brent is, obvious, is uh, also optimistic. He thinks that the 49ers are going to have an offensive line next year. We'll see where that goes for him. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I got to give one last special shout out to my, my, again, my, my newly found friend, Tyler <laughs> from the other evening. I, I really appreciate you making, making my evening. It was the first time I ever felt like a real celebrity 
or whatever you want to call it. Two shouts in one show to Jesse's new buddy, Tyler. Love is in the air. Right, DK? <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Hit the like button before you leave. Subscribe, rate, and review, and we'll talk to you tomorrow on IB Nation Sports Talk.